As many of you know, uh, us Big Blend Radio hosts Nancy and Lisa have been traveling the country full time on a quest to visit all of America's parks, public lands, and also share the stories of the communities that we visit and, and experience. And, you know, it's really interesting. We started this tour years ago and we had some places where we stopped for a while, but you know, the name John Free, C. Fremont, excuse me, John C. Fremont, General John C. Fremont keeps popping up everywhere we go. Uh, San Benito County in Central California, just outside Pinnacles National Park and in, in the community, historic community of San Juan Batista, there is Fremont Peak uh, State Park named after him. He actually uh, also where we used to live in the mountains in San Diego, just out, outside Julian is San Pasqual Valley. A lot of you will know that because of the wild animal park out there. Um, there's actually a battle. There's a famous battle that took place there and a monument there. And of course that touches back into John C. Fremont. And then we ended, we're here now today in Florence, Colorado to historic community, actually the very first place to have oil west of the Mississippi. And it was a bustling community. But it's also right near the Arkansas River and a park, one of the local parks here is called the Pathfinder Park. And it's got this giant statue. Nancy and I drive through <laughs> into town and we're like, who's that big dude, you know? And next thing you know, here it is. It's John C. Fremont again and talking about him and his relationship with Kit Carson and how he mapped the Arkansas River. So yeah, uh, mid-July, Nancy and I are scheduled to actually follow the Arkansas River from the headwaters to Little Rock and to where it actually dumps itself into the Mississippi River. So John C. Fremont's not going away. We uh, also, wasn't it Nancy in Greeley, Colorado, the historian at the museum uh, mentioned uh, John C. Fremont again. He, he likes the he, forts. Mm -hmm. He just keeps popping up. He's like, yes. he was all over. He really was Everywhere. all over the place. Well, yep. so this brings our segment today with Mike Guardia, Military Mike. Uh, he assigned us to a Love Your Parks Tour Mission Possible Story Series and following in the footsteps of generals. Uh, we're finding all kinds of generals. We talked about uh, General Grant and Sherman. Uh, both of them have their own sequoia tree named, uh, trees named after them in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks in California. And guess what? General Grant comes back into here too in the story of <laughs> Fremont as well. So it's, you know this this all ties together. Uh, Mike is the author of over ten books, including Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always, American Guerrilla, The Forgotten Heroics of Russell W. Volkman, Shadow Commander, The Epic Story of Donald D. Blackburn, The Fires of Babylon, Eagle Troop, and The Battle of Seventy Three Easting. Hal Moore on leadership, winning when outgunned and outnumbered. Crusader, General Don Story and the Army of His Times, and his latest book is Hal Moore, A Life in Pictures. All of them are on Amazon. Uh, you can also go to his website, markguardia.com. We're happy to have him as one of our experts on Big Blend Radio and in Big Blend Radio and TV Magazine. And joining us on these special Love Your Parks or Mission Possible stories on following in the footsteps of generals, not only the generals he's written for, but uh, uh, also the generals we keep bumping into on our adventure. So welcome back, Military Mike. How are you? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Nancy. It's great to be on the show, as always. Yeah. Hey, you know, do all these generals know each other? I mean, how does, you know, General <laughs> Grant, you know, bumps into uh, John C. Freeman. Abraham Lincoln is everywhere we're going. For some reason, he pops up everywhere. I understand how he, you know, he's a president and very popular, but these characters, you know, I, I hate to say characters, but it, I feel like we're stepping into their stories everywhere we go. It's pretty, pretty wild, you know, John C. Freeman being everywhere that we've been. And um, also, he was a governor of Arizona, our home state. So there we go. Absolutely. I think he's, Absolutely. he's done a Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that uh, the Army looks big from the outside looking in, but from the inside looking out, it's a pretty small community, and uh, it really has been for, I think, decades and even centuries. So, uh, you know, going back to your earlier question, um, all of those generals, yeah, they all knew each other, and uh, sometimes they got along. Most of the time they didn't. Uh, they had they had competing views. They had competing personalities, and um uh, some of them on occasion engaged in, you know, the little games of one-upmanship of trying to prove I'm tougher than you are or I'm smarter than you are. But, you know, I guess that's par for the course. Anytime you have a uh, small community that's run by uh, people who are qualitatively type A personalities. 
Mm, that's wow. right. And so he was born January 21st, 1813. He died in July 13th, 1890. His story is huge and he should have his own movie. And I think, Mike, you should write his story. I'm just saying it have to be like a like the encyclopedia of John C. Fremont's life. Um, but he really packed a lot in there. Some people think he was an incredible general. Some people think he was an opportunist. But then you look at how much he's done. It's pretty amazing. One thing um, that he was the first candidate of the Republican Party for uh, to run for office of the president of the United States. I didn't know that mm -hmm. he ran. Yeah. And so he was the first candidate, the very first one. He run. was. He was. And, you know, I, I really think that uh, I really think that Fremont was a lot of those things that you just said. I mean, he was a little bit of an opportunist, uh, a little bit of an opportunist. He was a little bit of a uh, he was a little bit of a genius. Uh, he was uh, he was a little bit of an adventurer. Um, a laundry list of contradictions when you look at that guy. And uh, I think when you take a look at uh, some of the most colorful people in history, uh, they all have a bunch of competing qualities. Some seem to negate the others, but uh, sooner or later they find themselves in the right time at the right place where whatever quality of theirs suits the situation really comes out in full force. Because, uh, you know, Fremont, he was, I think he was every bit a hero as much as he was an opportunist. And, uh, hmm. you know, his, uh, his contradictory personality at times uh, produced great success, and at other times it led to his downfall. And, uh, wow. you know, it, it uh, it really makes for an interesting character study. And I think, uh, you know, any psychologist out there would have a field day just trying to deconstruct <laughs> what it was that actually made that guy tick. It, it seems like he was great as an explorer and he, maybe he should have just stuck there and not gone into yeah. a government or politics or being a general or anything like that. seems like, you know, he could have just stuck out there in the bush and made maps and, and he seemed successful there, but as soon as he got mm -hmm. into where maybe he had to take orders from somebody else on a regular yeah. basis, it kind of rubbed in the wrong way. It did. It did. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was one of the, he, he was really one of the military officers where if, where he had, he had a very visceral understanding and a very visceral concept of what was right and what was wrong. And if he got an order that went contra to whatever he felt deep down in his gut, he would try to find a way to skirt around it. And uh, mm -hmm. that's actually what, that's actually what led to his relief, uh, not mm -hmm. once, but twice. Um, probably the most notable um, was during the outset of the civil war. And uh, here's where, here's where Vermont. Uh, really, this is where his his pioneering spirit really made him the right person to be in the right job at the right time. Uh, because you know his 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 map making expeditions to that point, he'd had four of them, uh, most of which occurred throughout the 1840s. But that pioneer spirit, as well as uh, you know the heroism that he displayed in the Mexican American War, really mm -hmm. prompted President Lincoln to you know call him back into Union service and say. You know, hey, John, we really need you. You know, uh, I know you're a little rough around the edges, so to speak, <laughs> but I'm essentially going to give you a carte blanche to do whatever it is you feel necessary to take care of this problem that we have out in the West, particularly out in Missouri, uh, because mm -hmm. Missouri was, you know, probably ground zero for uh, some of the worst things that happened during the Civil War. You had a you had a state that was technically under union control, but the loyalties were fiercely divided. Uh, it was still technically a slave state, so you had a good portion of the population that had a vested interest in the Confederate cause, but you had a seated government at the time that was trying to keep their support to the Union. So mm -hmm. he uh, essentially appoints Fremont to be the hand of God and wipe the slate clean in Missouri. Wow. And uh, he almost succeeds. And you know, at, at first, he almost succeeds. He uh, he, he uh, executes some. Uh, some brilliant maneuvers and shows some uh, very intuitive leadership at the first battle of Springfield is able to take Springfield from Confederate forces. But, uh, you know, he very quickly loses the confidence of president Lincoln when, when uh, he gets creative and says, well, gosh, here I am the head honcho in charge of the union army's department of the West. I got free reign over the state of Missouri. 
you know what? I am going to not only declare martial law, but I'm going to issue my own emancipation <laughs> proclamation here inside the state of Missouri. And I'm going to say that every slave owner here in Missouri, whether you're a union citizen or not, hey, you don't have your slaves anymore, and I'm going to muster them into union service. Wow. Well, the, the creativity in that regard was not greatly appreciated by President Lincoln, and uh, Lincoln ended up firing him. And Fremont, uh, ever the flippant man that he was, you know, essentially gave a dignified version of the middle finger to our commander in chief and said, <laughs> well, you know what? I'm glad you're firing me because you people don't know how to run a war anyway. Um, wow. And, and he Funny. very quietly, uh, he very quietly went back to his private life, but it, it, his private life really didn't last too long because uh, the political pressure from um, from the union politicians at that time really turned the screws to Lincoln to put Fremont back in charge of a command, uh, saying, you know, hey, uh, this guy actually was doing good things for us. He uh, gave us a victory at the battle of uh, at, at the first battle of Springfield which was the only Union victory in the West in 1861. Um, Abe, I really think you made a mistake. You really need to call him back and give him something. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he reinstated Fremont uh, 1862, right around the start of Stonewall Jackson's campaign in the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, the Shenandoah Valley was, for lack of a better term, it was a disaster for the Union Army. I mean, it was a decisive Confederate victory. And um, and unfortunately, Fremont found himself on the losing end during two particular battles uh, that happened during the uh, Shenandoah campaign. Uh, in particular, Didn't Lincoln the kick him out? Of, uh, Didn't Lincoln kick uh, him out of the, that? Time. Yeah, the second time because he tried to yeah. go back in after uh, Jackson and. You know, one lost and then he, you know, but I didn't, that battle, I didn't realize we had so many German, Germans on, on our side, you know, on the, on the Union side. You know, I'm starting to see that more and more in history that, you know, a lot of Germans were hanging out and, and helping the Union. I had no idea about that and going against, yeah. you know, it was um, mm -hmm. on the Civil War side, I should say. So that's, that was interesting to me, but it obviously, Lincoln went at him again. For the yeah, it's like I'm going to get you again, <laughs> no matter what. Yeah, right. Oh. Yeah. So 1862 wasn't really a good year for Fremont. He, uh, you know, he was um, he was part of the command leadership that uh, unfortunately was on the losing side at the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic. And um, shortly after uh, the Army of Virginia was formed, um, Fremont actually resigned his commission in 1864 and became a presidential candidate that year for a startup party called the Radical Democracy Party. <laughs> and it, it was a uh, it was a splinter party that, you know, of course didn't go anywhere in the electoral college, but uh, you know, was enough of a splinter faction to get recognition on a national basis and uh, you know, it was really just the uh, was really just the last hurrah in uh, what was what was Fremont's uh, long life of radicalism and activism mm. and really just a very colorful, somewhat flamboyant personality. What do you think with his wife? Because his wife wrote like the expeditions. And so it's, it's portrayed that, you know, they fell in love and Thomas Benton, his wife's, you know, dad, didn't, didn't he help fund his expeditions? And, you know, so that's part of where that opportunist part comes in. Some of the historians were like, did he really, you know, hook up with Jesse, his wife, you know, future wife, uh, for the money for the expeditions? Or, you know, was it true love? And then apparently on the expeditions, he didn't want to write up everything that he charted and did. And she is the one who wrote the expedition reports and eventually became a, you know, well-known author. So I wonder about that relationship. You know? Well, yeah, I think it was. I, I think here again, you have a mixed bag. I think love certainly was a factor. Um, you know, given that this is the 19th century, and you know, the 1800s sentiment at the time uh, was more geared towards true love than I think is prevalent today. 
so you know, I do think that uh, I do think that true love was a factor. I just don't think it was the only factor. I think uh, you know Fremont uh, saw this as kind of a two for one deal. Hey, lucky me. I'm in love with this girl who's uh, very easy on the eyes, and my goodness, her dad's loaded. So this is uh, this is a financial <laughs> windfall for me as well. And um, she can write. <laughs> yeah, and she can write. So I, I I think in some ways, I think in some ways, she kind of tempered the extravagance that uh, he portrayed in his public persona. Now you know I I there I don't have enough information on how Jesse was in her private life. But, uh, you know, just, uh, I just think that she was the, in, in some ways it was the traditional marriage where you had the, uh, wife fulfilling the, filling the role of logistical support while the husband was the one who was doing most of the action and the, uh, the, uh, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for. He was out in the field doing most of the daring do. Yeah. He, yeah. He was the one executing most of the daring do while she was the one who was organizing it and, uh, and putting it into a marketable format for the writing market. If that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty good couple when you think about it, mm-hmm. you know? Yes. It's not like she just took care of the kids and, and he went off and did his thing. They kind of work together uh-huh. on specific goals. It, it appears that way anyway. Right. It's hard to tell because there's really there's uh, some information about him, but you because we weren't there, you just have to hope that what you're reading is totally accurate and it it right. it's all over the place when people talk about him. Mm-hmm. I find him interesting about when he was mm-hmm. in California because you know it, there was the Mexican American War, but then things changed, and he led a couple of those battles. First was where, what is now Fremont Peak, or Fremont, as you say, Mike. I should get it correct. He's got that little dashy do on his E on Fremont. Right. <laughs> I just remember, yeah. you know, I don't know about it, you know, because it was Fremont's Peak where everybody kept going, you've got to go to Fremont's Peak. And what's mm. interesting about this, this mountain range, a friend of ours actually hikes it all the time. Jim Ostick, he goes up there and, you know, you can see Monterey, you can see the ocean from there in the Gabalon mountain range on clear days. Mm-hmm. And this area is used, and it has an observatory. So it's a history of, yeah. you know, actually here's your astrology and, uh, you know, astronomy, excuse me, astrology. <laughs> yeah, we're going to tell you our horoscope <laughs> now right. too. But it's it's interesting. But that that is where he kind of did like a little ambush attack. And then I think he did it again in San Pasqual down, you know, Further in Southern California, he did these little ambushes up where people wouldn't think that you would go to jump out and, and attack. So he kind of had that little rogue amb- ambushy thing going on in the military from what, I, from what I've been reading. Yeah, he sure did. He was, uh, mm. he was, he, he was a man who uh, sees the opportunity and uh, it, it, for better or for worse, a lot of times he just threw caution to the wind. Mm. And he's how uh, the California column, or I should say the battalion, I always think about the California column. He, he was part of, you know, forming that. But then also that's where the flag of California comes from with the bear on it. That's where he mm-hmm. he apparently yeah. helped put that in place. But I didn't know this either, that he he got into the gold rush and he became quite wealthy. It didn't mm-hmm. last, but he became, he became quite a wealthy dude. Right. Over the gold. Sure yeah. Did. Wow, this is amazing. So all these different expeditions, you know, it's kind of like Lewis. He was like a Lewis and Clark when you think back to, right. you know, what they were doing and, you know, going up and down the river. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot of him as as we go. But then it's going to happen, you know, when we get back east, too, with the Civil War side of things, being able to. I don't think there's a part of this country he hasn't been almost with his travels and, mm. and also fighting, you know. Would you ever consider writing about him, Mike? <laughs> uh, you know, he's he's had a he's had a few biographers do some sketches on him, so I mm. I don't know if me writing about him would contribute anything new. But I would love to write his story just for the sake of telling a story of a man who uh, did some pretty incredible things and you mm. know just lived life 
as a, as a modern day rogue and a modern day adventurer, you know, the likes of which you don't really see anymore. And I think given yeah. where we are in history, you really wouldn't see anymore because there's really no more frontier and there's a, there's no uh, internal discord yet. I mean, knock on wood, you know, no internal discord yet that would uh, precipitate another civil war. Mm. Right, I hope not. Yeah. And and he mm-hmm. traveled a lot with Kit Carson. Yeah, that was his like right hand man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole other cool thing to that, do when that, we were in. Go ahead. That, I was going to say that actually makes you think twice about him because people like Kit Carson, you know. So it's like, why would he hang out with this other guy? That maybe people are looking at him like, you know, he's a bit of a control freak. He seems a little bit radical and does whatever he wants even if he's told by the president don't do that he's like oh yeah watch this <laughs> so it makes you wonder about kit carson a little bit yeah hmm. well you know i i think uh, i think he and kit carson were kindred spirits in as much as they both had that pioneering spirit uh you know mm-hmm. kit carson of course i think was uh far more measured and uh far more uh, able to exercise restraint in his behavior than than John C. Fremont, <laughs> but um, you know I've noticed that uh, I've noticed in uh, several endeavors that I've been in that uh, people who have um, who have recognizable counterpoints in their personality uh, can work together and use those similarities that they have to accomplish great things, even if that's the only thing that they have in common. Mm, that's mm, true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So, you know, and I, I, you, you, you see stuff like that again in military history. I mean, if you take, for instance, uh, if you take for instance, Omar Bradley and George Patton in world war two, you know, on the one side, you have George Patton who was very gruff and very bombastic and uh, you know, was every bit, uh, the stereotypical alpha male on the one hand, and then you have him working in tandem uh, with an incredible partnership and incredible synergy with Omar Bradley, uh, who was very quiet, who was very measured, uh, who was, you know, by every standard, the, I'll almost say the stereotypical officer and, and a gentleman. I mean, two completely mm. different personalities, and they worked together to, uh, you know, roll the Nazis back in one campaign after another on mainland Europe. Mm. Yeah, it's about keeping what what's your goal, what's your end goal. Yeah. And what can you what can you unite on? You can't, yeah, be all connected. So they did have children. So you know, there there's also that history. But um, it's you know when you think about. He goes into all these amb- ambushes and, you know, going after Stonewall Jackson. You know, the generals we've talked about before with you, Mike, they've gone to West Point or they've had all this military training. Did he just end up in the military and, and fighting and just, you know, knowing how to do a you know, how to use a gun and, and cannons and things like that from, you know, his expeditions or did he... Do you know if you actually went to like a military school? Well, you have to consider that uh, back in the 1800s, it was a bit easier to get a commission and it was a bit easier to get into the military than it is today. Um, you know, West Point wasn't the only game in town back then. And I mean, it's certainly not the only game in town now, but uh, you know, there were, uh, there were a handful of men, well, actually, I should say more than a handful. There were several men who had experience with hunting and trapping, and mm. had experience uh, f- f- fighting the Native Americans. Um, if not within an official Indian war, then you know, just in various skirmishes on the frontiers, who were able to apply for direct commissions, or you know, who were given special appointments by state governors, or were even given brevet commissions by you know, various field commanders. And you had a, you had several great officers, several great men in military history, have their entry into the military through that way. And John C. Fremont was one of those men. You know, he mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, he was a man who had, who had some formal education, but uh, you know, his the the bulk of his education happened in the School of Hard Knocks. Mm. Yeah. I, that's I think because at that time too, 
when the civil war breaks out, like everybody gets in, you know, it, that kind of thing. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, the men go off, you know, whether or not you've, you've been to um, any kind of schooling for it. Uh, one thing I just saw now, John Charles Fremont Jr. Fremont, excuse me, Jr. was born in San Francisco on April 19th, 1851. Apparently he served in the Navy and he attained mm -hmm. the rank of rear admiral, and he also served as commander on the USS Florida, and he was he was a naval attaché to Paris and St. Petersburg, commander of the battleship USS Mississippi, and finally commandant of the Boston Navy Yard. How about that? So one of his mm -hmm. sons went off and did all this military, you know, that was his life, was the military in the Navy. So, mm -hmm. and Nancy, I just found this. Mm -hmm. John yeah. uh, John uh, John Fremont's Arizona house is actually on the grounds mm -hmm. of the Charlotte Hall Museum in Prescott, Arizona, uh, which where we, we were. Did too. Yes. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> we should have like gone. We needed. We need to go back there now and go see his house. Well, you know, it's one of those those um, people that unless you really really study study study, he's kind of there, but he kind of isn't. You know, you don't. And the only reason, like when we saw this huge sculpture at a park here, there was Fremont, Fremont, and we're like, wow, that's that dude, you know? And um, it came as a kind of a surprise. And then when you start reading, you realize just how much he has done. It, he mm. just sounds to me like he was very hot-headed and kind of would do whatever he wanted regardless of, what he was supposed to be doing or told to do. So he obviously would like to give orders and not take them. That's kind yeah. of how he comes across from the things that I've read, but people do have different opinions about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. it's going to be interesting. Yeah. It, 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 you know, most great people in history – I've noticed they uh, they tend to be a bit polarizing, probably more mm -hmm. than they should be. You, you have mm, uh, yeah, yeah, because I think a lot of the most interesting uh, people who have made their mark on history uh, just have so many contradictions, and it's so easy to find evidence that supports one view or another. And mm -hmm. uh, Fremont is definitely one of those people. You know, I. Mm. I uh, not that I'm an expert at all on clinical psychology, but uh, you know, I don't think that he is. I don't think that he fits the clinical definition of a narcissist, but you know, you see some narcissistic type qualities come out mm -hmm. here and there, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it uh, it it really just adds to the depth of the character study. I also, think... I wonder about the communication process during these times. You know, like we have email and texting and all this, you know, new technology where communication can be instant if you want it to be. But back right. then, um, how long did he have to wait um, to get a decision from President Lincoln? Maybe he just felt it took too long. I mean, they probably, yeah, it's like, I know they had telegraph, but right. maybe he just felt like things moved too slow and he's just one of those got to move on a lot faster than the people around him. Right. And, you know, that's uh, that's actually something, you know, Nancy, I'm glad you touched on that, because uh, that's something that military leaders at every level, even today, wrestle with. Um, mm -hmm. even, in, even in today's world where we have instant communications, where we have high tech, high speed Internet mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, texting and uh, communication that's as close to real time as you can get. Yeah, You know, uh, d d d nobody really knows the situation better than someone who is on the ground at ground zero watching everything mm -hmm. happen right in front of him. Uh, so it, it makes it very hard uh, for any leader, I think, in any situation, any organization um, to, you know, to follow – to follow guidance from several echelons above strictly to the T strictly to the letter mm. when situations on the ground can change instantly. And I, I really feel for, uh, I really feel for a lot of the leaders who, 
fought in these conflicts from mm-hmm. centuries and even decades past where where that wasn't possible. And I truly think that that is something Fremont had to contend with because you had the telegraph, which was about as close to instant communication as you could get back then. But by mm-hmm. and large, uh, the most effective way to send communications and not have them be intercepted uh, from a competing telegraph or what have you would be to send runners and to have right. way stations, you know, along mm-hmm. predetermined routes. And that could take, uh, if you were lucky, that could take a week to get to you. And, you know, by the time that order gets to you, you know, the situation mm-hmm. on the ground dictates something completely different. Um, and I think it's a, I think it's a travesty really that that wasn't more mm-hmm. of a consideration in times past. And I think if it had been probably some of our, more hard charging and more uh, colorful leaders might not have been relieved under the circumstances that they were. Wow. That's interesting about that. I was reading this one account where um, the person who wrote this said that Fremont was um, avoiding, he knew that, that Lincoln was going to fire him. So he just purposely made it so messages couldn't get through to him. Because he felt like if he got that message, he'd have to obey. But if he didn't, then he wouldn't. So he kind of pretended there was an imminent battle, which history says there, there most likely wasn't, so that he could tighten ranks and not let messengers get through. Now, I don't know how true right. this account is, because I wasn't there. But apparently the man who got through dressed up as a farmer instead of dressing <laughs> as somebody from the military and he was able to get through and deliver the message that, that Fremont was fired. But it's funny, you know, cause I don't know how true that is. Cause I really don't, but wow. it's an interesting take on the lack of um, ability to have an instant message, you know, and, and then do what you're told, especially if you're going to get fired. It's like, okay, I just won't open that envelope. How about that? <laughs> I, I think Ken Burns better do a documentary on this. I want to see people running through, you know. <clears throat> that reminds right. me of, there's this joke going around on Facebook where two birds are looking at what appears to be a scarecrow. And one says, no, it is a scarecrow. And they're like, how do you know? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have a phone in the hand. <laughs> so it's kind of that interesting thing with, you know, the farmer running through the field. Like, get that message, you know. Meantime, it's not a farmer. Yeah, you know, when you think about history, you know, you have to make those decisions and it happens in business. You have to make a decision. You know, I remember I had a boss once who said to me, um, you know, make a decision and beg for forgiveness later if you're wrong. You know, and I sometimes feel that's what you have to do is you just you can't wait for 10 years to to make a decision, not in battle. And, you know, battle gets dirty and battle is there's a creative part of that, you know, on how to get at your opponent. So, um I think he was into that, that into that part of it. So we're going to um, make a map of Fremont. We'll get this stuck in our head and start saying his name correctly. Mm. Of all the places we go, we'll take a photo of any kind of historical marker. Unfortunately, we've been to places like San Pasqual. We'll have to go back to Julia, Nancy, to do that. Um, oh, but we'll do like a, a Fremont <laughs> map so we can mark all the places that we go on the tour with him on there. Because that would be cool. For people yeah. to see and follow the pathfinder. What? <coughs> excuse me. What I do find interesting, Mike. Um, we were just in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Talk about military history there. My gosh. Um, and we were in a hotel called the La Fonda on the Plaza. Uh, an incredible, incredible hotel with so much history. And the artwork in there was commissioned. That you know, the Harvey House had this whole thing about doing real art and um, showcase you the history and uh, the Native American culture, and they commissioned this one artist to do these ten paintings to you know basically use as postcards. And the one painting is of Kit Carson, and Nancy and I were looking at the painting of Kit Carson. We're like, man, they're following us everywhere. But at the the <laughs> title of the painting was the Pathfinder. So there's yes. a side of me that wonders, like, did he take Kit Carson's nickname somewhere yeah. along the line? <laughs> so there's there's all these weird little things. I mean, now it's a car, but, 
you know, it's um, I wonder how that happened if Kit Carson had the name the Pathfinder at one point. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure he did. Yeah. As yeah. A matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Pathfinder was a uh, was a popular nickname that uh, a lot of cartographers gave to themselves. They. Uh, oh. They, oh. They uh, uh, for uh, for better or for worse. I mean regardless of whatever success they had in had in blazing trails or making maps or you know making uh making topographical representations of the american frontier uh a lot of them uh, fancied themselves with the title of pathfinder and uh that uh that spirit in a sense actually lives on today um some of your listeners might know that uh, the army actually has a school called pathfinder school and the the whole basis of that course is to train soldiers of practically any occupational specialty to be able to uh, to be able to blaze trails and find and find and create helicopter landing zones. Oh wow, wow! Is, does laser work hmm. get into this now in these days? Like looking at things aerially and using like a laser laser technology. Oh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Like laser technology. I know that some of the historical parks that we're going to where they have ruins, Mm -hmm. they're using some kind of laser technology that maps things what's underground, and they're able to see what to do. So I I was wondering if, you know, if the Army and the military are doing that kind of thing, too, when they make maps. Well, I can can say for sure that uh, we have laser-guided munitions um, as far as laser-integrated topography uh it wouldn't surprise me if we did but i don't know for sure if we do but that would certainly be interesting to find out yeah Mm. i think this whole laser thing is neat that you can find you know graves you can find other buildings that's how they found the 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 easter island statues those big heads Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) the other part of them and they you know it's really fascinating stuff you know what you can find so Man, military Mike, this is, you know, good conversations here. I'm enjoying all these, learning about all these generals. And last time it was all about war crimes. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, The one thing I wanted to touch on before you go is another book is coming out, right? Or is it two coming out this year? Uh, Actually, it is three. Oh, Oh. my gosh. What happens in between times when we don't talk? (laughs) He writes another book. (laughs) Uh, The ideas just keep on coming. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure uh, what I touched on in our last interview, um, but uh, what is on the horizon um, for what is on the horizon for the rest of 2019 and into the spring and summer of 2020? And actually, I take that back. Now that I think about it, there are four titles on the horizon. Oh my gosh! Um, the first, one, <laughs> yeah the uh, the first one uh, I think I mentioned previously. It's um. It's uh, the latest installment uh, for the Casemate Illustrated series, and that is called American Armor in the Pacific. And it looks at the Sherman tank and its role on some of the island battles in the Pacific theater of World War II, you know, on places like Tarawa and Iwo Jima. And uh, then coming out uh, earlier this fall is a book called Tomcat Fury, and that is a combat history of the F-14 fighter jet. And uh, in a wow. similar mm-hmm. vein, one of the 2020 titles is a book called Wings of Fire, uh, Combat History of the F-15. And uh, then um, in, between, in between those two titles is another book uh, called Danger Forward, and that is a biography of a gentleman named Paul Gorman. Now, if that name doesn't resonate with any of your mm-hmm. listeners, um, Paul Gorman uh, was a 1950 West Point graduate. Um, got his baptism by fire on the hilltop battles of the Korean War, where he was decorated for bravery, um, stayed in the military Ooh. through Vietnam, and as a brigade commander, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross uh, for his heroics at the Battle of Bong Trang, uh, which, he managed to help, which he managed to hold off an enemy Viet Cong battalion while he was being burned by napalm. Oh, Wow. Yes. Oh my and gosh. He, yes, and he he lived to tell about it. Uh, he he wow. he fully recovered from his wounds in that battle. And after Vietnam, he became the principal architect for the 
infamous Pentagon Papers. Ooh. Oh, wow. That's, that's why I know the name. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, and his legacy doesn't stop there even, because uh, after he was the after he was the driving force behind the Pentagon Papers, which you know exposed the harsh reality uh, of the top-down bureaucratic mismanagement in Vietnam, uh, mm-hmm. Paul Gorman later became the commander of U.S. Southern Command in the 1980s, and Southern Command is responsible for all military operations in South America and the Caribbean. And where that is on the timeline, he was commanding. Uh, he was commanding Southern Command while we were doing operations in Grenada, and also when we had troops in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Wow! Wow! Mm. Wow! 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 So this is pretty <laughs> epic content. And then I want to know about these, you know, these jets, these fighter jets. So you're looking at, you know, how they were, you know, created and manufactured, and then what wars they fought in and who was using Absolutely. them. Wow. Absolutely. And uh, the, the, the F-14 uh, probably has, uh, it probably has the most popularity simply because that was the jet that was featured in Top Gun. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, and, I know all uh, about yeah. that. <laughs> exactly. <God. laughs> yeah. He's a Hollywood man. <laughs> I know. Yeah. See? Wow. Wow. This yeah. is interesting. Well, we can't wait for it. And I, uh, man, so next time we talk, he's going to go, well, there's book five and six, you know, just yeah. keeps going, <laughs> keeps on rolling with it. Good for you, man. That's awesome. That's so everyone, cool. again, well, um, all of my, all of Mike's books are on Amazon. Uh, you can go to his website, MikeGuardia.com, go to his Amazon page and see the masses of books that he has and, and uh, watch for his next ones. He's also on Twitter and Facebook. He keeps people posted on all kinds of military history, especially on those two uh, social media sites. And you can keep up with him on blendradioandtv.com. You'll see him in our expert department. And, of course, follow the Love Your Parks Tour at loveyourparkstour.com. You'll see our Mission Possible Story Series page there. And you can link to uh, Mike's assignment to us. And, uh, as we said, we're going to be doing our Fremont map or Fremont, the map of Fremont. I know. You know, all of a sudden he'll haunt us, Mike. He's going to go, like, you got that map wrong. That's not how you do it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be different. I he's going to argue have with Google. Google. Yeah. Like MapQuest. <laughs> yeah. He have any That's so that. funny. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So, you know, we like to play music for you, Mike. So this one, I just, I like this song for uh, from Mont, you know. It's called Wheel of Destiny because it's just, it's interesting because you could spin the wheel and we'll have a different story on Vermont, and you know you're either going to like it or you're not. <laughs> so, I just thought this was a cool song from it's from our friend over in South Africa, James Saunders, and everyone you can keep up with him at jamessaundersmusician.com. He's on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, but here it is, Wheel of Destiny. Thanks so much for joining us, Military Mike. All right. Well, the pleasure is always mine. Love being on the show. Yeah, we Thanks, enjoy it Mike. too. So Next fun. time, we'll, it's all about your book. So, um, and we'll keep you up to date on Vermont, on all the new places we discover. Here it is, Wheel of Destiny.
Destiny. 